Hey everybody, this is one of the videos y'all probably have been waiting on for about a month. When I react to Nick, everybody loves Nick's videos. Nick is the fat electrician, aka Nick from Iowa, but he also has another channel called The Fat Files. In The Fat Files, he does videos that aren't military history so much, but just Nick being Nick, going off on a rant. If you have not, please go over and check out The Fat Electrician and The Fat Files, and both of those links will be in the description of this video. So y'all check him out. This is a brand new video. He dropped it yesterday. I didn't even peek at it uh, because I was at camp. Uh, I don't, I've don't. i told y'all I volunteer for a camp for children and adults with special needs, and I spent two weeks doing that. I just came in. This is Saturday. I'm going to record this reaction. My son's going to edit it. Ryan, producer Ryan, he will be editing this thing and having it out by sometime Monday, which is when I want to drop every Monday. So hopefully we get this thing out on time. And I hope you enjoy this rendition. This is going to be my first look too, y'all. Let's see what's going on with Nick. Okay, I finally got around to doing that video on that time America launched a manhole cover in outer space with a nuclear bomb. And it turns out that's actually the lesser of two interesting parts of this story because America also dropped a nuclear bomb on top of six people to prove that nukes were safe. What? <laughs> Today we're talking about Operation Plum Bob. The professional way to explain it would be to say that it is a bunch of nuclear testing that was carried out by the United States government in the late 1950s in the deserts of Nevada. However, in reality, it is more akin to the United States government dicking off with nuclear warheads in the desert like they're a bunch of rednecks on 4th of July with fireworks. <laughs> we'll shoot fireballs at. But first, a word from our sponsor. Oh, Nicholas. Yeah. Is this my Father's Day present? Well, I do have a surprise for you. What's that? Our credit cards are maxed out. I'm gonna need you to fix it. I'd like to go shopping. <laughs> I this love video is brought to you by Henson's Shaving. Okay, here's the deal. Henson's is a family-owned machine shop that makes parts for the aerospace industry. There's literally parts on the Mars rover that these guys made. And one day they woke up and they're like, hey, we're just going to make the most precise safety razor on the market. And this is it. This is all they sell. It comes in aluminum or titanium. If you want to pay extra, it comes with a little stand. And then they also sell the razor blades so you have a one-stop shop. Not because their razor blades are proprietary, because this thing will take any shaving razor blade on the market. You don't have to buy their proprietary cartridge. You don't don't have to sign up for their monthly delivery thing. No, you buy this one time and then you can put any five cent razor in it and shave for the rest of your life. So the product itself is fantastic. Like, but more Paul, Paul. The company is awesome because every time a YouTuber does an ad like this, they get sent a little media packet full of talking points, what to say, what not to say, and so on. Now I'm not supposed to disclose this, but the brief that I got for Henson's basically said, there is no script, do whatever you want. We trust you. Also in the first paragraph, they said this quote, if for whatever reason you don't get a good shave with our product, please let us know. If we can't help you, then don't endorse us. We think we've made one of the very best razors in the world. If you disagree, we'd rather not ask you for a non-genuine endorsement. So the razor is great, and this is the type of company awesome. that you actually want to give your money to. I'm going to have a link for them down below. Let's get back to the video. All right, Operation Plum Bob takes place in 1957. There was a total of 29 nuclear explosions, and they were testing all kinds of different stuff. They had biomedical testing going on with pigs, seeing how radiation affected them and at what distance. Then they were covering the pigs with blankets, seeing what materials blocked the radiation, what materials didn't. They also conducted experiments on 18,000 U.S. service members, basically having them dig a trench off in the distance and hide in it while they detonated a nuclear warhead to see how they held up. And then they had different buildings and structures built out of different materials, trying to see which building materials blocked radiation the best and which ones blocked them the worst. Now, when this started, all the bombs that were being detonated were being detonated off the top of a tower or from a high altitude weather balloon. They were just detonating nuclear warheads into the open atmosphere. What could possibly go wrong, right? 
And the important context here is that it's 1957. The world became aware of nuclear weapons 12 years prior at the end of World War II, and a couple years after that, the USSR had their own nuclear weapons. We are well off into the Cold War, and nuclear hysteria is at an all-time high. So by this point in time, the American general public doesn't just understand that nuclear weapons make a really big boom, they also, to some degree, also understand radiation and nuclear fallout. So everybody kind of understands what's going on at this point. I mean, they've even got cartoon turtles teaching kids what to do in case a nuclear bomb Duck and gets cover. dropped near them. And so yep. naturally, when everybody finds out the government is strapping nukes to balloons and blowing them up in the desert, there's there's quite a bit of concern, you know, like, hey, maybe that's a bad idea. And then everybody finds out this is actually mm. how the government's planning on protecting them from a nuclear strike from the Soviet Union. Everybody finds out this is actually how the government's planning on protecting them from a nuclear strike from the Soviet Union by taking one of our nukes and blowing up the Soviet nuke in the sky right above everybody's heads ladies and gentlemen uh the genie air-to-air -air missile okay you gotta remember this is the 1950s there's no intercontinental ballistic missile that can reach from the soviet union into america yet so this means that the only nuclear strike risk really comes from soviet bombers flying into america and dropping their bombs so we got to be ready to shoot down these planes right obviously problem again it's the 1950s there's no sophisticated anti-air systems yet okay there's not really any air-to-air -air missiles that our fighter jets can shoot accurately so the going theory was that we're going to use this nuclear fucking missile and shoot it at an entire formation of Soviet planes and blow all of them up at once. Genius. Okay, and on a rudimentary <laughs> level, this makes complete sense, right? If you can't be accurate, you increase the margin of error. If you're not good with shooting a pistol, maybe grab a shotgun. It's easier to hit your target. However, yep. what they've went and done with the Genie missile might be a little bit of overkill because what they've essentially said is, well, I'm not very accurate with air-to-air -air missiles for shooting down planes. So instead, I've opted to create a spawn point for the fucking sun. So naturally, now everybody's <laughs> absolutely terrified and the government's like, guys, guys, calm down. It's going to be completely fine. There's no, you know what? I'll just prove it to you. Give me five volunteers and a camera guy, but don't tell him what he's doing. On July 19th, 1957, the United States government detonated a Genie air-to-air -air nuclear missile with a 1.5 kiloton warhead directly above the heads of five U.S. service members that volunteered to be there and a camera guy that was not informed of what he was doing until a couple hours beforehand. Holy crap. I'm out. What? You cannot pull out of this. I'm pulling out. We're way too deep to pull out. I'm pulling out. No, we are not. You are leaving it in. I've been pulling out for years, son. And in your head, you're probably picturing like <laughs> five dudes in hazmat suits with a welding mask on. No, it's literally five bros in their military uniforms standing in the middle of the desert oh with my no God. glasses, making direct eye contact with a nuclear explosion while one of them is holding a sign that says ground zero population five because that shit's Gosh. funny. We felt a well, one of them's got sunglasses. A very bright light. A fireball. It is red. The sky looks black about it. It is boiling above us there. It is rapid. Excuse me, color. There is the ground wave. It is over, folks. It is tremendous. Directly above our heads. It went. It went. Okay, now let's just take a minute and appreciate the fact that you've probably just witnessed the most testicular fortitude ever captured on camera. Secondly, let's also admire the fact that the sign that says Ground Zero Population 5 is not only funny at face value, but it's hilarious that they only counted the five of them in the camera and not the cameraman himself, because even back in 1957, they knew that the cameraman never dies. I'm actually like Frodo Baggins. And out of respect for them being, to the best of my knowledge, the only six people that have ever volunteered to have a nuclear warhead dropped directly above their foreheads, I'm going to go ahead and read their names off. Uh, the cameraman's name is George Yoshitake, and the five service members are as follows. Colonel Sidney Bruce, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Ball, wow. Major John Hughes, Major Norman Bodinger. Wow. This isn't just enlisted men that are forced to be out there. This is a major, or these are majors, lieutenant colonels, and a colonel. This is 06, 05, and 304s. These are, these are, these are officers that stepped up and did this. So, um, good on them.
Hunter and Don Luttrell. Apparently the cameraman, Mr. Yoshitake, had filmed a bunch of other nuclear tests in the past, and he thought that this was going to be no different than all the other ones, you know, where he's miles and miles away just filming a mushroom cloud, and he didn't know that they were going to be dropping the bomb directly above him until like a couple hours beforehand, and he was already there. After arriving to the test site, he was briefed on what was going to go down, and according to him, he was pretty much completely unfazed. He did not care at all, and he was 100% game to partake in this experiment, which I think we can all agree is gangster as fuck. Oh, this yeah. What did you picture? I walk in there like a fucking gangster. And then he goes on to live a normal life until he passed away in 2013 at the age of 84. And the other five okay. service members that were also involved in this experiment all lived full happy lives. As far as I could tell, the youngest any of them passed away was 71, and the rest of them all lived into their 70s. And while it's great that they were all okay, the PR stunt itself wasn't really that effective because the general public wasn't swayed very much by it. They still wanted them to stop blowing up nuclear bombs all the time. So yeah. finally, the US government's like, fine, fine. We will we'll stop blowing up so many bombs in the desert and the American people are like and above the desert in the atmosphere Okay, okay fine and above the desert in the atmosphere and in the ocean <sighs> Fine, we won't we won't detonate nuclear bombs in the ocean either and that and then they went to Baxterville, Mississippi and did it in a salt dome that is the story of how nuclear testing finally came to an end. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the government then decided to opt for the loophole and they were going to bore a 500 foot deep hole in the middle of the desert so that they could blow up a nuke underground because nobody would be mad because people were only mad about on the surface, in the atmosphere, and in the ocean. Surely blowing one up underground wouldn't be that yep. big of a deal, right? Yep. I mean, what could go wrong? Delete me. What are you doing? I already did the ad. Uh, Jalimi's gonna do every episode from now on. Really? Yeah. Wait, how much are they paying? Don't worry about it. Anyways, you guys know the deal by now. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> you give Delete Me money, they turn around and they make sure the data brokers on the internet aren't selling your personal information. And after they get it all taken down initially, they continue to monitor it and make sure nobody else starts selling it in the future. So if you're interested, I'll have a link and a discount code down below. Let's keep going. I mean, I'm not an overly smart guy or an explosions expert or anything, but I mean, off the top of my head, I've got some concerns. Primarily, I've seen the cinematic masterpiece Armageddon where Bruce Willis convinced me that a bunch of dudes <laughs> that work on an oil rig are easier to train to be astronauts than teaching astronauts how to drill a fucking hole i mean that was the entire premise of the movie drill a hole stick a nuke down it blow the planet you're on in half i understand 500 feet probably isn't deep enough for that to be realistic but Brett. still nothing good can come of this you're gonna like piss off king kong or unleash that ball rod thing that killed gandalf godzilla here. something bad is gonna happen now luckily they're not planning on detonating a nuclear warhead in this hole they're just planning on blowing one up and what i mean by that is the the premise of this experiment was basically remember we're worried about the ussr bringing bombers planes and dropping a nuclear bomb on america and we're planning on shooting those ussr bombers down essentially we're going to blow up those planes that have a nuclear weapon on board they want to know what happens when you blow up a nuclear weapon with a conventional type bomb or missile right hmm. so they're going to stick a nuclear warhead in the hole with another bomb and they're going to blow up the conventional bomb and see if that blows up the nuclear bomb as well because we need to know that and the going theories that the nuclear is not going to explode because nuclear bombs have to be set off in a very particular way and if they don't get set off in that exact way there's safety measures that are actually supposed to kill the nuke rather than set it off but that's all theoretical and there's only one real way to actually test it right you're gonna back throw it up, in the ground camera yell world star and see what happens so that's exactly <laughs> what they do july 26 1957 they have the first underground nuclear test ever known as pascal a takes them all day to set it up they got to lower the device down this hole they get everything ready then on top of the hole you know in case the nuclear bomb does go off they lower a five foot thick slab of concrete that weighs thousands and thousands of pounds wow and then on five top foot of the hole, they have some kind of lid i'm not sure what material it was they didn't say lead on top of the lid there was a bunch of sensing equipment because remember lead not would be my guess explosion they're expecting a really small explosion and they want to get as much data from it as possible so they have like sensors and cameras aiming down the hole through this lid and i will now let the head scientist in charge bob brownlee take the story from here and i quote they finally got it down the hole by my recollection about 10 o'clock at night or so there wasn't much time to go back to mercury go to bed get up the next morning and shoot it so somebody said why don't we just shoot it now and then go in and it was the world's finest <laughs> roman candle because at night it was all visible blue fire oh shot hundreds of feet into the air 
everybody was down in the area and then they all jumped up jumped in their cars and drove like crazy not even counting who was there and who came out of the area uh, wow. so the safety equipment didn't work the nuclear part went off generating an explosion about fifty thousand times bigger than they were anticipating apparently the explosion was so large that seismic equipment from all over the world could sense this explosion you know seismic equipment being the shit they used to detect earthquakes another scientist that was present described it as and and I quote, the biggest damn Roman candle you ever saw. It was beautiful. <laughs> Big blue glow in the sky. And because of oh this, the United God. States government comes with the realization, okay, maybe underground nuclear testing isn't that great of it. I'm just fucking with you guys. Uh, they redid the exact same experiment like a month later, August 27th, 1957. And they didn't really change a whole lot about the experiment. They took the device, they stuck it down the hole, they put thousands of pounds of concrete directly on top of it. And then the only thing they did change was instead of whatever lid they were using before that they could like put sensors through and shit they went and tried to control the explosion by getting a 2,000 pound manhole cover and then they welded it shut over the top of the hole they then took the best wow. high speed camera they could find and aimed it at the manhole cover because if the safety device failed again whatever happens to the manhole cover was and i quote scientifically interesting aka they're just doing Mythbusters shit with DOD money. So they detonate the bomb, the safety device fails, the nuclear portion goes off. And in hindsight, what happened is when you have a nuclear bomb go off with thousands of pounds of concrete directly on top of it, that concrete is instantly vaporized and turned into gas. Wow. And then that gas is pretty also instantly superheated and superheated gas expands a lot, and this is an enclosed environment because they welded the manhole cover shut. If you're not picking up what I'm putting down, the scientists just they just made a big turned the planet boom. into a fucking potato gun and launched this 2,000 pound manhole cover, presumably into outer space. <laughs> yep. So all the scientists being pros start asking the question that everybody wants the answer to. How fast do you think that manhole cover was going? So they go to the high Pretty speed damn camera. Fire. Okay, this camera is taking one frame per one thousandth of a second. Okay, it's a lot of fucking pictures. The manhole cover appears in one singular frame and that is it. So because it was only captured by a single frame and not multiple frames, they can't calculate how far it was traveling over a period of time. So all they can calculate is the minimum speed that it would have to be going to only be captured by a single frame in the span of the camera shot. And the calculation they came up with was that manhole cover was moving at least 150,000 miles an hour. Wow. That is Mach 195. <laughs> it is 195 times faster than the speed of sound. And the best part about all this is that this happened prior to Sputnik 1, meaning that if this manhole cover made it into outer space, it was the first man-made object to ever make it into outer space. Uh. It didn't make it into outer space. It would have burnt up in the atmosphere just like meteorites do. Buh. Oh, shit, you're right. I completely forgot that every single meteorite that's ever come into the Earth's atmosphere is burnt up completely and never actually makes it to the ground i'll be right back i've got to go tell all the dinosaurs to stand up and quit being babies because clearly they're exaggerating <laughs> Guys, they're dead. This is completely different from a meteorite for multiple reasons. For one, a meteorite's never been made out of 2,000 pounds of refined steel. For two, a meteorite's moving at about 30,000 miles an hour when it collides with the Earth's atmosphere. This thing's moving at 150,000 miles an hour, and space is only 62 miles up, okay? This thing made it to outer space in a second. Even friction was like, what the fuck was that? Thirdly, the collision <laughs> with the atmosphere is nothing like a meteorite, right? A meteorite is a rock traveling through the vacuum of outer space with no no other forces acting upon it and it collides with earth's atmosphere and then it gets slowed down and it gets burnt up okay the manhole cover isn't just moving at 150,000 miles an hour through the atmosphere it is being propelled by a channeled nuclear explosion with all of the gases aka the atmosphere behind it also moving 150,000 miles an hour in the same direction yes science okay and just to be clear <laughs> i'm not saying that i'm correct i'm simply saying i'm incredibly ill-equipped to answer this question accurately and no offense but there's about a 99.999 percent chance that you are too so my verdict in regards to this manhole cover is going to be that it's still up in the air
It was a horrible dad joke. I'm sorry. Moving on. Now, fast forward, <laughs> nuclear testing continued both underground, above ground, and in the atmosphere until 1963 when they signed a treaty with the Soviet Union and Great Britain that the only nuclear testing allowed was going to be underground. Now, fast forward again a couple of decades and people's concerns over atmospheric nuclear bomb detonations turned out to be 100% legitimate because a ton of people ended up having elevated risks of cancer. Both the 18,000 soldiers that were present at Operation Plum Bob had highly elevated likelihoods of developing leukemia and thyroid cancer, as well as thousands of civilians that were living in towns near the test sites. Yep. And I know what you're thinking. How come those people got cancer, but the guys that literally stood underneath a nuclear bomb as it was detonated didn't? Well, the way that nuclear radiation works is that it dissipates pretty quickly over like two to three days and then it's completely gone which is why like all the old videos and protocols telling you what to do in case of a nuclear attack always told you you know duck and cover from the initial blast wave and then make your way inside and stay inside for like a week after that the radiation is decayed enough that it shouldn't hurt you so the guys that were exposed to that bomb directly overhead were exposed to it for presumably 10, 15 minutes before they dipped and left, whereas a lot of these soldiers were exposed to repeated nuclear explosions over and over again. Ah. These towns, the explosions would go up into the atmosphere and the radiation would be caught in the wind and it would just carpet these towns with radiation for days over yep. and over and yep. over again over the yep. course of years hundreds of nuclear detonations exposing these people to radiation now fast forward like three decades to 1990 the united states government with its infinite charity and outstanding moral compass finally decides that they're going to pass the radiation exposure compensation act where they're going to pay these people that were wrongfully exposed to radiation due to their negligence if you got cancer and you could prove that it was because of them they would go ahead and they would give you seventy five thousand dollars dollars in one lump sum if you were a soldier on the ground or if you were an innocent civilian just living your life in a town miles and miles away they would give you fifty thousand uh, dollars there's no other legal course that you could take you can't wow. sue them for more you can't reject it just here's what i'm going to give you fuck off oh that sounds like a really good deal how about i give you the finger Okay, just so we're on the same page with this, the United States government takes your tax money, whether you want them to or not. You don't get an option. They're taking your money, okay? They then turned that money into radiation that they used to poison Americans with and give them cancer. Then, 30 years after the fact, they decided, you know what? We should make things right by giving the people that survived this long and can actually prove it was our fault. We'll give them like 50 grand. Bear in mind that 50 grand is also money that was tax money that they took. So they, they took your money, used it to poison you, and then to pay you off, they gave you some of your money back. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Can you understand how absolutely <laughs> crazy that is? Imagine if somebody walked down on the street and was like, hey, give me all the money in your wallet or I'm gonna throw you in a cage for years against your will. And you're like, uh, okay. And you give them all the money in your wallet. They turn around, they go buy brass knuckles, come back, and then and punch your, you in the face with the brass beat knuckles the shit out of you just bought with your money. And then they look down at you and they're like, oh, oh, I really hurt you. My bad. And then they get into your pocket, find another $20 bill, pull that $20 bill out of your pocket, and then hand it back to you to pay you off <laughs> for punching you in the face. It's never too early to learn that the government is a greedy piglet. Uh, amen. On a taxpayer's teat until they have sore chapped nipples. <laughs> I gotta end this video. I feel radical. Eyesed. Uh, in conclusion, this has been the story of six crazy bastards that volunteered to have a nuclear bomb detonated directly above their head and that time that America may have accidentally launched a manhole cover into outer space, potentially becoming the first man-made object wow. ever, and that time that the U.S. government poisoned tens of thousands of people with radiation, giving them cancer, and basically had no consequences for it whatsoever. Thanks awesome for watching. Awesome video. Those channels go by some more. Awesome. with the fatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Great job, Nick. The government giving people cancer with zero consequences while trying to tell me I can't drink raw milk. I don't even want to drink raw milk. I'm just <laughs> mad they think they can tell me I can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You got to love Nick. He has the best intros and the best outros of the world. And look, if you look over here, yes. I, I've watched this one. I'm, I'm going to tell y'all right now. I've watched the band of beavers and because of my conservation, uh, background, um, 
I was going to do that, but when I saw that he had a brand new drop, um, so look for me in a month to review this video right here. I will be in a month. I'll be reviewing the band of beavers. Hey, look, if you have not, please subscribe to the fat electrician, the fat files. And Hey, what, while we're at it, if you haven't clicked that like and subscribe button, on this channel, please do so. I'm I, I'm just a little guy trying to build myself up to be cool enough to hang with these guys. Thank y'all for watching. If you stayed here this far to the end, uh, you're my heroes. Uh, we'll see you next week.